Well, I'm so excited to be here and speaking to all of you. Um, I have, as Alan said, I'm currently working with um, for PNND in New York, mostly on the movement of nuclear weapons, like actions and campaign. But I also have previous experience doing a lot of bill tracking on nuclear weapons um, legislation in the U.S. Excuse me, Maven, can you just slow down a little bit? There are oh, some sorry. English as a second language speakers on the call. Thank you. Sorry, I do tend to talk a little fast. I'll, I'll slow down a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think what's really exciting is that although we do tend to see this trend of like growing nuclearization and growing investment into nuclear weapons, which is kind of scary, there actually has been a good amount of initiatives introduced into the U.S. Congress very recently that would cut especially U.S. spending budgets and cut nuclear weapons spending inside the United States. Um, these are just a few graphics that show how much we are spending on defense. Um, this one on the left here is defense in general. On the one on the right, I found really interesting because I believe these are a little bit old, but the um, ratio is about the same. That over here with this little hazmat, the nuclear symbol, is the amount of money that the US is spending on cutting nuclear weapons. And then the little house is how much it would cost to end homelessness in the United States. Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, although the world is planning on spending $1 trillion on nuclear weapons in the next 10 years, the United States is the majority of that number, but also planning on spending $1.7 trillion on our own nuclear arsenal in the next 20 to 30 years. And a recent budget office estimate says that in the 2020s and 2030s, nuclear spending will peak at $50 billion a year, which is so much money. Um, that could house every homeless person in America for the next 147 years. It could pay for every federal food aid program for children for the next 40 years. It could pay every public school teacher's salary in America for the next five years. Um, it could, the list goes on and on. It could just, just so many things. But as I said, there are initiatives to combat this, especially after the withdrawal from the INF recently, which I know Abolition 2000 did a big webinar on the INF, so I won't go too into detail on what that was. But I will say that directly after the United States withdrew from it, there were a lot of action, both from grassroots organizations and in the Congress itself, of immediately introducing bills to combat that. Um, so I'm just going to run through eight. I believe there's eight current bills in Congress right now in the House and the Senate that deal with cutting budget spending in some way. And I'm going to go through them really quickly. I do have the bill numbers up here, and I can try to either provide this PowerPoint or just a list of the bill numbers because I do recommend going on to congress.gov and reading them, the whole bills for yourself if you're interested, um, and just following along with them. So I'll see if I can get that to people after the, probably with this PowerPoint. Um, the Hold the Line Act is a Ted Lieu in the House and Senator Ed Markey, who is a PNND co-president in the Senate. The Hold the Line Act in the House currently has the most co-sponsors, the most activity. It's still a pretty active bill. It would specifically ban low, low yield nuclear weapons, which are, have been called um, a more responsible or more usable nuclear weapon, which of course doesn't exist. Uh, so it's very concerning that these are in development. So the Hold the Line Act would ban those completely um, and prohibit spending. I should back up a little bit because I know that not everybody on this call is from the United States. In the United States, our Congress has sole control over the budget and the defense spending budget which is why so much of this action for cutting the nuclear budget is coming out of Congress instead of like localities, because the easiest way for the United States to cut our spending budget is if there are acts passed in Congress that prohibit funds from being spent towards nuclear weapons. Just as a little overview. So we have the Hold the Line Act, which would stop money from being spent towards low yield weapons. We have the Prevention of Arms Race Act of 2019, which was released quickly after the INF, I believe. Um, that would essentially stop any more development on nuclear weapons unless reports could be submitted proving that it's not escalating any sort of arms race. We have the INF Treaty Compliance Act of 2019, which is a Tulsi Gabbard Act. Um, she's currently running for president and she's been pretty vocal about denuclearization, especially after Hawaii had the false scare where it was a false alarm, but all of the, there was the nuclear detection systems went off um, a few months ago. Um, it pretty much says exactly what it sounds like. It would just say that we should act as if the treaty is enforced and no funds may be appropriated to any sort of INF banned weapons. Um, Preserving Arms Control Treaty Pact Act of 2019 does very similar things. Um, the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act of 2019 is an Eleanor Holmes Norton Act. It hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but I really wanted to focus specifically on this because 
this one, it has been introduced in the past, in the past few Congresses, and it specifically draws a connection between climate change and energy and nuclear weapons, um, which I will also touch on later, but is very important for the type of coalition building that we are trying to build personally with the account of nuclear weapons money, but also is a good idea to approach this um, crisis, I guess, of nuclear weapons. Um, it specifically includes provisions for dismantling test facilities and creating what she calls an economy of peace and uh, views nuclear weapons as a perpetrator of climate change in a really interesting way. And then I just wanted to end on the embracing the goals and provisions of the Treaty of Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is a representative for Govern Act. That's the newest one. That would do lots of things. It would do no first use. It would end the president. Our president has the ability to launch an attack pretty much unilaterally, and it would end that. Um, it would cancel modernization plans, and it would also stand behind the TPNW, become a city like, uh, bec um, sorry, apologies. It would essentially just back the TPNW that's in the UN and um, instruct the US government to pursue multilateral disarmament, which is a, a, really, a really big statement. Um, we obviously, we don't know how many of these will actually pass, but I think it's just really exciting to see that there is so much action, and it, it gives me personally a little bit of hope that there is action specifically with our parliamentarians to roll back our, our excessive spending. I did want to touch briefly on the SANE Act. We don't have a SANE Act currently introduced. Um, Senator Ed Markey and Representative Errol Blumenauer have in the past two Congresses introduced the Smarter Approach to Nuclear Expenditures Act. And we do know that um, Ed Markey is planning on reintroducing this. We're expecting it sometime in the fall to line up with the UN Disarmament Week activities and kind of be cohesive. Um, I obviously don't know what this exact bill text will say, but in the past it has included calls for annual weapons counting, cost estimate reports, prohibiting new IB, um, intercontinental ballistic missiles, prohibiting other long range missiles, other warheads, just completely cutting funding for a lot of new and dangerous technologies. Um, also in our, Ed Markey is a PNND co-member, or co-president, sorry, and in our brief conversations with him, they've expressed interests his office has expressed interest in widening this approach to more groups and getting more voices in, which kind of connects to what I was saying about connecting this to climate change and conservation is that a lot of this can be connected to climate change, which um, I think Tony mentioned in the beginning how climate change has a lot of momentum right now and nuclear weapons don't, but the connection of those two can be really powerful when you're trying to talk to parliamentarians, when you're trying to talk to other groups to create coalitions. It can also be connected to humanitarian aid. It can be connected to women's rights. There's a lot of discussion right now about the intersection between like global women's rights and nuclear weapons. Um, and also I know that in the United States right now, there's a really big push away from for what we call forever wars. And the idea that there's the United States Congress has not authorized many of the wars that the United States is partaking in. So I've also had success approaching it from the idea that having the president have control over nuclear weapons and having so many nuclear weapons available is taking control of war out of Congress. So there are a lot of ways to frame this, to connect it to other um, activist groups and social justice progressive issues that congressmen, parliamentarians, activist groups might care about more and kind of bring this momentum that we are seeing, like ride that and connect it to other things to create a broader approach, I guess. Um, I just wanted to end by talking about the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization, which authorizes the, our national defense spending every year. The one that just passed through the House is really exciting because it reduces funding for ICBMs and new warheads, and it also would cut $100 million from developing things that were banned by the INF. Um, we don't, this is not, the, it's the version that passed through the Senate is different, obviously, and we don't know what will happen with reconciliation, but again, there's just, there is a lot of momentum happening right now, especially with the withdrawal of the INF, and we can really ride that to go forward and to widen our approach. And I think that's it. I do want to just mention very briefly that there is action on the state, university, community level. Uh, New York City recently is working on a bill in the city council that would create New York City as a nuclear free zone, this um, divest the city from nuclear arms and also follow Paris into being like a nuclear free city, which would be really exciting. But I, um, a lot of what's happening at the less than federal level is divestment, which I know we'll get to later. So I don't want to talk too much about that. 